top at fusionness. Problematic. <laughs> okay, so the last section we're going to cover is another new section, uh, probably the newest section. Um, and it's to do with gene discovery, gene fusion discovery, sorry. And I need to give credit to Chris Marr, who is another uh, faculty at Washington, Washington University at, and affiliated with the Genome Institute. Uh, and he very generously uh, let me use a lot of slides. So he's really an expert on fusion detection. He wrote one of the uh, popular fusion detection algorithms. Um, and he gives a lot of talks on fusion detection, so I shamelessly stole many of his slides. So just to remind you, we are on the final module. And um, this part won't be quite as working example. Well, I hope it's a working example when you have the time to run it. Uh, but it takes quite a while to run, and I wasn't able to get it down to a kind of bite-sized reasonable running time. So we're going to have to kind of pretend a little bit with uh, the tutorial. <clears throat> so learning objectives for this part, which is the lecture, uh, we're going to discuss the relevance of gene fusions in cancer. So gene fusions are probably not only important in cancer, but that's certainly where you think of them most often. Um, <clears throat> RNA-seq is, of course, an approach for detecting gene fusions. It's one of the, the good approaches. Uh, we're going to talk about some criteria for removing false positives and for uh, prioritizing your candidates. So one of the biggest challenges with gene fusions is no matter how clever your method is for predicting them, you generally always have more false positives than true positives. And so you need to filter out false positives and then you still need to narrow down to what um, candidates are actually likely to be interesting in terms of biology. So just a quick introduction to gene fusions in cancer. Um, they obviously have clinical significance. They can sometimes be the ideal diagnostic or prognostic markers. So for example, 95% of people with um, CML, a kind of leukemia, harbor the bcr able fusion. So this is the fusion resu resulting from the Philadelphia chromosome or Philadelphia translocation. Uh, and it's a fusion between these two genes. And what it basically does, actually I think there's another slide that explains it, so I'll save the explanation of BCR able. Um, another uh, reason that fusions are interesting in terms of clinical significance is they can be a good target for um, therapy. Actually BCR able is an example of that as well. And there are other uh, fusions which indicate a good uh, treatment course. There's a kind of paradox amongst the common epithelial cancers. So to date, a large percentage, 80% of known gene fusions in cancer um, have been found, I think something's missing there. They've been found within 10% of all human cancers. So they're heavily biased, at least in terms of what's been discovered towards blood cancers like lymph lymphomas and leukemias but we're starting to find them more and more in the solid tumors as we get better at looking for them. Uh, and the common epithelial cancers count for 80% of cancer-related deaths, uh, yet contribute only 10% of known gene fusions. So there might be some interesting discoveries still to be made there. So how do gene fusions work, or what, what's the molecular consequence of a gene fusion? Um, one, like the bcr able example, is uh, basically the classic example of creating a fusion. So you have uh, some exons of one gene basically being fused together with some downstream exons of another gene. And in a case like bcr able, what's happening is you have like an important tyrosine kinase domain here that's being essentially super activated or constitutively expressed and activated by the fusion with this other gene. And that basically ramps up this kinase, kinase activity, causes all kinds of growth factor pathways to be activated, and leads to tumor genesis. Another similar uh, mechanism or related mechanism is when you have 
the regulatory region, so not the coding sequence, but actually just the upstream region of a gene being fused onto another gene. So here you have an oncogene like MYC being upregulated by being fused to the regulatory uh, features of IGF, IGH. <clears throat> so both of these are fairly common mechanisms of fusions. Oh, that's really fuzzy. Uh, this is just to give a little history of uh, fusion detection. So in the slides, fusion and chimera are kind of uh, syn synonymous, interchangeable words. Uh, we started with longer sequence data. Actually, even before 454, we started looking for fusions in Sanger data. So then we had long reads, and we were basically looking for um, long single reads or short single reads in some cases. And we're looking for uh, that single read to span a breakpoint, essentially. So we're looking for reads that uh, don't align properly to the reference genome, taking the unaligned reads, uh, and then trying to map uh, each part of the partial alignment to where it goes in the genome. Uh, with the Lumina reads alone, just the short single reads, it's uh, a little bit trickier because you don't tend to have like these big long alignments. Uh, so you get, but the concept is basically the same. You get some unaligned reads or a read that's partially mapping but uh, has some mismatches at one end and you go through a kind of iterative process to identify cases where you've got alignments against more than one chromosome or more than one part of a chromosome that appears too far apart. And the concept hasn't changed much, but with paradigm reads, we get basically an extra kind of evidence. So it's too small to really see, but you have two kinds of situations. One where the um, read actually spans the fusion breakpoint, which is similar to what we were looking at with just the single reads. And then you have paired reads, which encompass uh, the fusion. They don't actually cross the breakpoint, but one read is on one side and the other read is on the other side. And from that you get basically two kinds of evidence, the so-called um, spanning reads and the encompassing reads. And this is a little bit easier to see that. So if, you, if this is a breakpoint here, we've got um, these mate pairs which are encompassing that fusion junction, so the these reads are on the left side of the, the fusion, and these reads are on the right side of the fusion. And then we also have some mate pairs where one of the mates is actually spanning the fusion, where the read is partially broken by the fusion. And most of the fusion detection algorithms, including the one we're going to look at, Top Hat Fusion and Chimera Scan, which Chris has developed, are looking for some amount of evidence from both of these categories. And you can detect some fairly uh, complicated rearrangements with these approaches, not just like a simple fusion. So a lot of uh, gene fusions have actually been discovered using RNA sequencing. Um, there's a list from a review in 2012 uh, covering a wide range of different tumor types. And you'll notice the sequencing technology is listed here. So some of these were identified with whole genome sequencing, but the majority of them have actually come from RNA sequencing. So RNA sequencing has been really useful for identifying novel fusion genes uh, in tumors. In non-tumor cells? I think they have been, and I think people have done surveys of non-tumor cells, but I don't think you see you don't see that many of them. They definitely happen, like just naturally it, it happens. I mean, you don't see as much genomic rearrangement in normal cells as you do in tumor cells. I mean, that's a feature of cancer. But there are translocations, and sometimes those translocations cause fusions, which in many cases maybe don't matter. They just cause like a nonsense product and doesn't cause any problems. But every once in a while, one of those translocations will cause a fusion that causes a oncogene to be activated, and then you potentially have, have a tumor. Yeah. So actually, we're going to talk about that as a kind of false positive. 
I don't know I, if I've read any papers about. I doubt they're generally very highly expressed, but they they could be. <laughs> Can you use this to kind of assess your assembly if you've got a normal tissue where you're not expecting all those patients? Can you do that to see if unrelated sequences have been stitched together when they shouldn't be? Because <coughs> we had some guys that tried to fill the assemblies with themselves, and then when I like to the blast of a random sample of assemblies, it was just there were so many chimeras that shouldn't have been there. But is there like a, a pipeline I can use to decide if this is a rubbish DNA or something? Oh, is a transcript. I mean, I guess you might consider making a practice of running your RNA seq data through a fusion detection pipeline, whether you expect there to be fusions or not. Then you'll start to get a sense of like what's a reasonable amount of fusions for a normal tissue of type X or whatever. And then, yeah, you might see some red flags if you're trying a new assembler and it's like way off the map compared to what you've seen with other assemblers. The only thing I would say is that these pipelines for fusion detection are much less polished than the, like for example, the Cufflinks top hat pipelines. Uh, they're also slower. They're also famous for producing crazy amounts of false positives, so the data is already noisy. So using it to assess noise will s somehow be a little bit tricky. Um, like you, you tend to see with the fusion detection pipelines, a lot of manual massaging and post-processing going in to get down to sometimes finally deciding you don't believe in any of them, or maybe you find one or two or half a dozen that seem convincing. But you're usually starting from lists of hundreds or thousands of or tens of thousands of potential fusions. So it could work, but you'd have to like, you'd have to get a good sense of what the um, variability in um, the results looks like f for even when it's working properly on, on well assembled data. Do yeah. you have to have uh, a lot of coverage to <coughs> account for any tumor heterogeneity in the sample? You're dealing with solid tumors? Yeah, you do. Um, I mean, if the fusion is, fusions are harder to, hard to detect, like there's this one breakpoint and you're hoping to get a few reads spanning it. So already you need good coverage in order to give your sense a chance of detecting. Like we see with um, SV detection, structural variant detection at the DNA level, that we, we miss a lot or we're only now getting to the point where we feel confident that we're catching them with like 30, 40, 50x coverage. So with the RNA, if it's a highly expressed fusion, you get a lot more chances to detect it. If it's lowly expressed, you will quite likely miss it, just like you're going to miss SVs in DNA data at low coverage. And then if you have tumor heterogeneity on top of that, it just compounds a problem. So if the fusion is in a, a subclone at 10% frequency, or if you've got maybe 50% purity of tumor and then heterogeneity in there, it's exactly the same argument you can make for rare splice forms, rare variants. Um, but yeah, the coverage really matters for detecting them because they're tricky to, to detect. And you'll see like the default um, settings for top hat fusion, I think they're only asking for one spanning read and two encompassing reads minimum with, and a total of five reads of either type. So you can see that, like how low they've set that to hopefully catch things. Like I think if we had more, better data that consistently had more coverage, everyone would probably feel more comfortable with allowing as little as one spanning read as evidence. But the fact that the parameters are set that way is probably indicative of the suboptimal coverage levels you can expect. So gene fusions discovered. We went through these, the different technologies. This is a list of some of the tools uh, that are available. So Top Hat Fusion is uh, one we're going to try to run today or look at how it would be run. Um, 
other ones I'm vaguely familiar with are Diffuse. Chimera Scan is the one that Chris Marr developed, and that's actually what we pretty much use at WashU. Uh, we're trying to get it automated in our pipelines, and he's running a lot of it through his own somewhat manual process in his lab. How does it differ from the scan? From Top Hat Fusion. Yeah, or any? Because there's a thousand of them, they all either do like this coordinate or split mapping, right? I think they're conceptually all similar. The How they differ in the details, you'd have to read the papers and really study them to know. I know that Chimera Scan and Top Hat Fusion conceptually work very sim similar. Um, I think we have a, yeah, we have a comparison here. So this was actually <coughs> not from Chris's lab. It was someone else did this analysis called, uh, or a paper called State of the Art for Fusion Finding Algorithms, Sensitivity, and Specificity. And they looked at a set of 27 validated fusions in a data set and compared uh, many of the fusion finders on the last uh, slide. And they actually found the Chimera scan was one of the best. So a couple things to note. First, none of them detect all 27 of the known fusions. The best uh, that we see is actually top at fusion finding uh, 19. But it's got a bunch of them wrong. Chimera scan detects about the same number and gets them uh, all well, I guess also about half right and half, uh, no, sorry, all right, none of them wrong, yeah. So I guess this is why uh, Chris was happy to have this slide to say that Chimera Scan is one of the best performing. So it's basically everything it's detecting is, is right, is a real fusion, and it's detecting almost as much as, as the best performing in terms of total detections. But none of them are detecting all of them, and, and most of them have problems. So a big issue, like I said, is prioritizing um, the gene fusion predictions. So you're going to run this, and you're going to get a ton of potential fusions. The first major task is to remove false positives. So one thing you can do if you're fortunate enough to have uh, normal samples uh, is to exclude fusions that are predicted uh, in the normal if you're looking for tumor-specific events. Uh, in the absence of adjacent normal tissue, which is, I would say, almost always, it's quite unusual that you're lucky enough to have match normal RNA-seq data, um, you can do things like run fusion detection on a compendium of normal tissues. So uh, Chris has suggested the Human Body Map Project to identify fusions in normal tissues. Then if, if you see these fusions coming up in like normal tissue or a wide array of different tissues, it's more likely that they're false positives and in any, any case not tumor specific. So he recommends this. Um, you can get that from the Human Body Map Project. Uh, I was reading the top hat page, top hat fusion paper before the line here. Um, so one thing I, they said that, that when they were assessing their false positive rate, they looked at a normal cell. They said that a normal cell should have no fusions. A normal cell could have fusions, right? I mean, not, not, not all fusions produce cancer, right? Yeah, it could have fusions. It's probably not true of that. You would expect few fusions in the normal. I don't know. If, I mean, maybe it has none, but I don't know if they, they certainly can't guarantee that. And I guess even if you have some normal cells with fusions, they won't they won't necessarily express an RNA product. And like it's probably a generally safe assumption, but it's not 100%. It might happen in the odd cell, but you're never just sequencing one cell. You're taking a pool of normal cells. So, whereas in the tumor,
Yeah, you don't. Know. It involves rearrangements with more, like fusion, if you will. Sorry, what kind of rearrangement? You need IgG to Yeah. So that's a source of a lot of false positives that you have to filter out usually. And there could also be assemblies in the reference genomes But yeah, one convenience you have when studying tumors is you have this clonal expansion phenomenon where some things cause a tumor cell to proliferate like crazy. And so you're actually getting a concentration of the very thing you're interested in. The main problem is that other events that happened bef right before that expansion also get carried along for the ride. So you have to figure out which one is the driving and which one is the passenger. But you do have that advantage compared to yeah, maybe a population of normal cells where there's a few random stochastic events occurring in some of them, but they're they're not expanding, so they don't they don't kind of rise to the top. So you might get um, some fusions with very low coverage uh, from uh, ligation artifacts that can occur during library preparation. So that's another source of false positives. Uh, and it's important to remember that reads which support fusions may not agree with the fragment size distributions of the library. So actually that's one of the ways we can kind of spot um, potentially interesting reads in terms of a fusion. Uh, and like looking at IGV, there's that one mode you can turn on where it, it colors reads that aren't agreeing with the expected fragment size. And sometimes that's a good way of spotting uh, regions where there's uh, rearrangement or fusion. Another thing you can do is look for expression imbalances. So a lot of times that what happens with a fusion is it's, um, it, first of all, you can look not only for expression imbalances, but also copy number imbalances. So at the breakpoint of the fusion, it's quite common to see, uh, in addition to the fusion, uh, amplification of one side. So you'll see like a very clear pattern in the alumina coverage that looks kind of like this, where it's like, there's a certain coverage level and then you'll get a big spike in a higher level and the break point of that spike is the same break point as where you predicted the fusion and you can al you'll also get potentially a spike in the expression levels so here he's showing an example of expression for exons 2 to 2 3 4 5 6 7 and so on and how there's like a big spike uh, right at exons i don't know 8 and 10 or 8 to 18 yeah so for these axons basically being massively upregulated and the rest aren't. And that can sometimes be a way of confirming a fusion. If you see a change in the expression that matches the predicted breakpoint from your fusion data. So it's really like when you run for genes, it would be a good idea to rerun it for genes. Your already see different gene expression to corroborate the genes. Yeah, it can be, yeah. Like I would definitely go and look at the expression estimates at an exon by exon level along with your fusions, your fusion predictions. Another good way of prioritizing your fusions is recurrence. So this is the most popular in a way. Everyone would love to find a fusion that is recurrent across many samples. Uh, and this is an ideal candidate for further screening uh, and potentially functional validation. So you're not often that lucky, but if you're evaluating a set of 50 tumors and you see a fusion occurring in 10% of them, that's kind of like Yahtzee. A lot of different fusions can occur. So here we're showing just some of the different situations. So the common one that people think about is like an interchromosomal translocation, where you have a fusion uh, between part of gene A on one chromosome and part of gene B or in this case, gene X on another chromosome. Uh, you can also have interchromosomal complex rearrangements. Um, so when breakpoints occur and uh, chromosomes are tr being translocated, there can often be inversions or amplifications. And so the fusion product that results can be more uh, complicated than just a simple end-to-end -end joining of uh, exons from two genes. 
Similarly, you can have intrachromosomal uh, rearrangements like deletions. So you can have a big chunk of the chromosome kind of drop out and then fuse two genes together from that would normally be quite distant. And again, there can be complex rearrangements occurring within a chromosome that can cause fusions. And then you can have read-throughs, which can be caused by splicing, where basically you're getting transcripts that are just reading from one gene into the next gene through, let's say, aberrant splicing. And that can look like a fusion. And you may or may not be interested in those. Some of those might be biologically interesting, and some of them might just be kind of noisy transcription that causes <coughs> false positives in your data. This is a challenge because actually read-through transcription occurs fairly frequently and much more frequently than the inter- and intra-chromosomal rearrangements that we tend to be interested in. So here's a group or population of different samples uh, across different tissues. And these are the, the numbers the, of samples which have various uh, read-through events compared to having inter- or intra-chromosomal events. So those inter and intrachromosomal rearrangements are um, here appearing generally just in one cohort or even um, just a single sample, whereas the read-throughs are typically occurring uh, in multiple samples. And you have to be careful because even though it's occurring across multiple samples, sometimes it's at a fairly low level and it can just end up being tumor-specific by chance. So you see it in a few of your tumors and not in your normal and think, ah, this is a tumor-specific event, but really it's not. It's just that you maybe didn't uh, see it by chance in the normals. Another piece of evidence you can use to kind of prioritize or validate your fusions is to look at the distribution of exon-exon junctions across different classes. Um, Basically, there's certain biases like read-through events or bias towards skipping the last exon of the five prime partner. That's just a common pattern of read-throughs, whereas the inter- and intrachromosomal rearrangements are biased more towards uh, random exon-exon fusions. So many of the recurrent read-throughs are thought to be likely splicing events. Um, so you might be interested in those or you might not be. A third way of prioritizing your fusions is to look at the predicted functional effect or see if they're functionally recurrent. So if there's selective pressure to alter a gene in order to achieve like a similar consequence, you might see that same gene uh, being a participant in fusions again and again. So you'll see like the same three prime partner appearing different five prime partners because the main thing is maybe these are um, various genes where it's just the regulatory elements are being attached and the main thing is upregulation of this three prime partner gene. And you, you tend to see that, like you'll see a lot of BRAF fusions where BRAF is being fused and upregulated by all kinds of different five prime partners. Uh, and the same can occur at the other end where you have overrepresentation of a five prime partner with different three prime partners. So that can be another clue of um, the functionality of a fusion and therefore ma make it higher priority. So this is just giving an illustration of that using BRAF. So here you can see BRAF uh, is being fused with a whole bunch of different um, five prime partners. And they were occurring um, kind of spotty within different tumor types. People were just seeing it one here and there. And it wasn't until you really look across a large set that you realize that this is an uh, important and recurrent event that's occurring in a large number of different tumor types. So sometimes actually integrating with larger data collections um, can re reveal functionally relevant fusions. So in our fusion detection pipeline, whenever we see a fusion, even if it's a singleton, if it looks real, we would um, compare that against basically a database of previously uh, reported fusions and use that to assess whether it, it might be uh, significant or interesting for that particular tumor. Whether the fusion is in frame or not can tell you a lot about whether the fusion is important. 
So typically, we're most interested in fusions that are res resulting in in-frame um, predicted proteins, just because if the protein is going to do something and drive tumor genesis, and especially if you're going to target it in a drug, you want it to be translating to a real protein. But it's not necessarily the case that you should um, exclude genes which are not in frame. So for example, P53 the tumor suppressor everyone knows is really important in cancer, and it's commonly um, participating in fusions with different three prime partners, and it's usually happening around the first exon. So what's happening here is p53 is being fused right early in the gene to various other partners, and that's eff effectively truncating p53. And it's actually in this case makes more sense for it to be not in frame because it causes a non-functioning protein, and that's just a way of shutting down p53. It's kind of like you see p53 del deletions. So another way of basically knocking out p53 is fusing it close to the 5' uh, exon with some other gene, causing a nonsense product. So gene annotation databases, uh, we mentioned this briefly, basically are either of the genes within the fusion interesting in terms of cancer? Are they involved, uh, do they involve a kinase in the three prime position? So like following on the pattern of BCR able? Could they serve as a drug target? Have they been shown to be rearranged in other cancer types? So when we get our final list of fusion uh, partners that are predicted, we usually go through this exercise of saying, are they cancer genes? Are they thought to be or known to be druggable? Uh, and searching the literature and searching some databases to see if they've been pre previously implicated as um, rearranged. So the general uh, pipeline or flow of what I just described, you start with your fusion predictions from Top Hat Fusion or Chimera Scan or some other software. You would typically filter false positives, uh, subtracting perhaps adjacent normal predictions if you have adjacent normal data, util utilizing different filters. Uh, you're going to look for recurrence, uh, both just in terms of overall recurrence across the patient set and uh, maybe screen for functional recurrence. So it could be uh, the same pathway genes being involved in fusions or something like that. Uh, then for singletons, you might prioritize those based on uh, whether they're in frame or other criteria. And then you would typically validate in the index case, so the case where it was discovered, and then screen additional samples. So you might design a PCR a product or a PCR experiment or a FISH experiment to go and look through a large set of maybe 100 or 1,000 other tumors of a similar type and hopefully detect that same event occurring elsewhere. And then, of course, there's functional validation, so you can create... Uh, maybe in cell lines, you could um, express that fusion product and see what effect it has and so on. So Top Hat Fusion uh, was chosen mainly because it comes with the Top Hat 2 installation, so we didn't have to do any extra work there, and we thought this would be convenient. Um, it has a relatively simple installation uh, and run procedure. The problem we've had with it is it requires a lot of extra data files, including some very, very large ones, and it takes a long time to run. So I don't think we would have had much different experience with another software, uh, but it's just the way it is with fusion detectors, I think. Uh, so how does Top Hat Fusion work? Uh, at a very simplistic level, it's basically starting with these initially unmapped reads. So reads that map perfectly to the genome and, and or transcriptome we're usually not interested in. They don't, aren't likely to be evidence of any kind of fusion. So we're looking for stuff that didn't map or didn't map well uh, using the conventional mapping procedure. And then we're taking those uh, initially unmapped reads and um, in this case you have some clue based on the segmented nature of alignment from top hat 
that maybe part of it aligns to one chromosome and part aligns to another chromosome. And there's this uh, fusion database that's created and you basically try to align that read across um, those fusion breakpoints. So you have these unaligned reads um, and you create these segments and then you go back to other reads and basically try and align them to those same fusion breakpoints to see if you can build up the evidence further for that fusion event. And there's several criteria that Top Hat Fusion uses, like uh, we talked about, it's looking for these supporting reads. So there's some reads that map properly along the transcript for that region, like cover, don't extend across a breakpoint and just map normally in that region. And there are other reads that either span or encompass this pr predicted breakpoint. And so those are supporting reads and these are contradicting reads. So it's going to somehow look for a preponderance of these supporting reads. And it has some other criteria. And this is one thing that really tripped me up when I was trying to make a simulated data set with fusions. So I had a hard time getting, even stacking the deck and creating like a really obvious fusion, I had a hard time getting it to pass these various criteria. So it's looking for supporting reads that have an even distribution across the fusion breakpoint, and also um, it has to be across a sufficiently wide window. So if you have just a bunch of fusions crossing the breakpoint, but <coughs> nothing to the left or right, like if it's too tight a distribution, it won't qualify. Or if there are some gaps, it may be disqualified. And I guess this is something they've developed to avoid obvious or consistent false positives that result from other kinds of events besides real fusions. But it made it hard to make a fake data set.